Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so excited to welcome you to today's event with John Tresh, discussing his latest book, The Reason for the Darkness of the Night, Edgar Allan Poe and the Forging of American Science, in conversation with Paul Lewis. Today's event is part of Harvard Bookstore's Friday Forum series, which takes place on Friday afternoons as a way to highlight scholarly books in a wide range of fields. Though we remain digital for the remainder of our summer series, we have an exciting schedule of virtual events in the coming weeks as part of this afternoon programming and others. So do check out our website for our complete event calendar. For today's event, we will conclude with some time for your questions. If you'd like to ask the speaker something, locate the Q&A function wherever it may live on your Zoom display where you can submit all your questions. We'll get through as many as time allows. If you go to the chat function of this presentation, I will shortly be posting a link to our website where you can purchase your copy of The Reason for the Darkness of the Night. If you already have a copy of this book or would like to contribute to this series and our store in a different way, I will also be posting in the chat a link to our website's donation function. We greatly appreciate any and all support you are able to extend to us at this time. Please note that closed captioning is available for this broadcast. Depending on which version of Zoom you are using, you may need to enable it yourself. Simply locate the button marked CC Live Transcript on your display and click through the options. And lastly, as you may know from the large virtual gatherings we've all been attending this past year, technical issues might come up. We do apologize in advance for that. If any technical glitches do occur, we will do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you so much for your patience and understanding. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. John Tresh is the Professor of History of Art, Science, and Folk Practice at the Vorburg Institute at the University of London. He is the author of The Romantic Machine, Utopian Science and Technology After Napoleon, and has written extensively on the methods, instruments, and the long history of change across science for the Public Domain Review, Anthropology Today, and numerous other academic publications. For his work, he has held fellowships at the New York Public Library, the Institute for Advanced Studies, and the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science. Today, he is joined in conversation by Paul Lewis, professor of English at Boston College and the immediate past president of the Poe Studies Association. Presently, he is the BOD chair of the Edgar Allan Poe Foundation of Boston, Inc where he has led efforts to commemorate the poet in the city of his birth. He's the author of the academic books, Cracking Up, American Humor in a Time of Conflict and Comic Effects, Interdisciplinary Approaches to Humor and Literature, as well as the illustrated satire, A is for Asteroids, Z is for Zombies, a bedtime book about the coming apocalypse. This afternoon, they will be discussing John's latest book, The Reason for the Darkness of the Night, A Girl and Poe and the Forging of American Science, a bold and electrifying biography of the mysterious writer that Rivka Galkin calls a masterwork on a master. In these pages, we meet the engineer of horror, the trickster of reason, and the mutinous captain of mystery. For those acquainted with Poe's legendary work, Galkin's praise speaks not only to Poe's penchant for the macabre, but to our enduring fascination with the eclectic author himself, transporting us to the era in which Poe lived, a time when the enterprises of entertainment, speculation, and scientific inquiry were even more entangled than they are today. The reason for the darkness of the night introduces us to Poe the scientist, taking us through his early training in mathematics and engineering at West Point to reveal an artist whose lifelong ambition was to advance and question human knowledge. In his work, characters grapple with not only the darkness of the human heart, but the darkness of uncertainty, the darkness of reason a gloom that John Tresh is here to help us explore today. We are so excited to be hosting this event. Without further ado, I'm now delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is all yours, John and Paul. Super. Um, thank you, Benjamin, for that wonderful introduction. And a uh, big thanks to Harvard Bookstore for hosting this, uh, to Paul Lewis for agreeing to join me in this conversation, and to everyone who's here for, for, for being here as well. Um, we're going to start um, with a reading from the book, and in, in keeping with one of the themes of the book, it's um, I'm going to give you a little magic lantern show to go with it, to make also to make the most of the virtual technology that we're all living with. And this is a picture that some of you may never have seen or and might not recognize, but it's a Poe very different from the one that we know from the haunted 
horrified daguerreotypes from the end of his life with the mustache staring out at the, in, in, into the abyss. This is Poe in, uh, in the height of his career in the, in the early 1840s, where he's obviously full of optimism and self-assurance. Um, it's just after the, the Raven was published. But the, the moment that I want to return to in this reading is a bit earlier, 1842, when Poe is in Philadelphia, which saw itself as the Athens of America. It was really the center for invention, science, and the merging between those and uh, commercial enterprise. So there's a really easy exchange between scientists, engineers, inventors, publicists, and writers. And Poe was part of that, that very um, active scene of, of innovation. He was the editor of several journals and really at the peak when he was the editor of Graham's Ladies and Gentlemen's Magazine. He lifted the subscriptions of that magazine from about 5,000 to upwards of 50,000 in just over a year. He was um, relatively happy with his, uh, with, with his family living on Locust Street, his mother-in-law, Mariah Clem, and his cousin and wife, Virginia Clem. And everything seemed to be going just fine until in, in early 1842, Virginia, while playing on the rented piano and singing, burst a blood vessel and coughed up blood, which was a sign of consumption. And there was no cure. And from there, um, Poe really began to spiral downward. Um, perversely, he quit his job at Graham's in the middle of an economic depression and was forced to find his way um, really on his own. And in that very dark period of his life, he wrote some of the stories that he's most famous for. Uh, tales of torture and guilt, the, the pit and the pendulum, the black cat, the, the mask of the red death. And that's where we pick up right now. The fall of 1842 saw Poe working on his masterpiece of morbid suspense, The Telltale Heart. The tale revived the observation drama of his earlier works. It employed language and imagery from the sciences, but gave readers an experience not of certainty and reassurance, but of disorientation and horror. Opening in the middle of a conversation, perhaps an asylum visit or a trial, a narrator boasts of the sharpness of his senses. True, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous I had been and am, but why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed them, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. The speaker has become monomaniacally fixated on the opaque eye of the old man who shares his house. I think it was his eye. One of his eyes resembled that of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell on me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man. He proceeds with cool, objective detachment toward an irrational goal. With patience and precision, he stalks the man peering into his room at midnight with a lantern open just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. On the seventh night, on the seventh night of this death watch, the old man awakens, sensing the, the intruder. After an agonizing silence, he stealthily opens his lantern until at length a single dim ray, like the thread of a spider, shot out from the crevice and full upon the, the vulture eye. At once he hears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton the beating of the terrified old man's heart so loudly he fears that neighbors will hear. In its detail and regularity, his description mimics the report of a meticulously designed scientific experiment. Light, long a symbol of knowledge and reason, is here associated with madness. The view of Poe's narrator is filled by a film-covered eye, not the perfectly adapted apparatus, which was taken as a sign of God's wisdom in natural theology. The darkened room he violates recalls the camera obscura, the technical core of the daguerreotype, an enclosed space into which images of the outside world were projected and reversed. Yet the light that pierces the room is artificial. The image projected is not the external world of creation, but the thread of a spider ensnaring its prey. The tale restages one of the primal scenes of modern science, Isaac Newton's experiments in the optics. There Newton detailed the steps through which he carefully cracked open a shutter to let in a single ray of light into a darkened room and dismembered it by passing it through a prism, revealing the colors of the spectrum. Poe's tale inverts Newton's experiment, making vision and methodical reason the agents of perversity and death. He flips the heightened sensitivity celebrated in new precision instruments into pathology, allowing his narrator to perceive many things in hell. 
he murders the old man. Methodical as ever, he dismembers the body and buries its parts beneath the floorboards. The police arrive. He coolly entertains them, offering refreshments, placing their chairs directly on the guilty floorboards. He then begins to hear, once again, a constant beating, like a watch wrapped in cotton, his dead victim's heart growing louder and louder. The merciless pounding and the indifferent chatter of the police drive him to a frenzy until at last he cries out in horror and agony, confessing his crime. Just as his desire to demonstrate his rational calm led to the unco uncovering of the crime, his heightened senses gave him access to sounds that took him beyond the limits of normal experience. By detailing an act of violent irrationality in the language of scientific method, Poe dramatized the dark side of the Enlightenment, a vision uncannily familiar to Americans enmeshed in an allegedly rational economic and political order defined by ruthless competition, slavery, and violent settlement. Though usually presented back to them in soothing tones of equality, freedom, and progress, beneath the appearance of calm reason, pulsed veins of terror, obsession, and cruelty. Poe gave the screw another turn. While the heart beneath the floorboards might symbolize the narrator's criminal madness, the monstrous guilt that his reason and patter cannot mask, it also echoes the ultimate symbol of method and rationality. The, me the mechanical watch, the embodiment of Newton's clockwork universe, and the icon of natural theology, and the argument from design. The tale peels back a rational surface to reveal inexplicable and irrational forces. When another layer is lifted, these forces are revealed as instruments of a deeper mechanism with a reason all its own. It also made for a damn good read. The tale has terrified school children and delighted adults since its publication. Paul, I can't hear you, Paul. Could you unmute? Okay, sorry about that. Uh, but uh, thanks so much for asking me to join in this conversation and thanks for that reading. Um, I had some sort of general questions, but I feel like just jumping into where you left off with the telltale heart. Um, many people would be surprised to find that there are these echoes of science in the story. And I, and I wonder whether you think Poe's interest there is actually in doing science in some way or in sort of using allusions to science, but twisting them in directions of Gothic fear and horror so that the, the average reader who might know more or less about it at the time would feel sort of something irrational is being done at the heart of something that should be rational and empirical. So it, is his interest primarily literature, literary and the effect on the reader? Definitely, I mean, it's a, it's a short story designed to, to produce an effect, but exactly as you say, part of the way that effect works is by working with the sound and the convention of these other genres, which are really widely circulated at the time that people are well aware of the new language of scientific discovery and scientific reporting and using that, that language and, and rhythm of method, insisting on the rationality, the meticulous precision of every step taken, which creates this greater and greater gap as you begin to realize that actually he's not in control of his senses or his reason at all and is, is using this kind of mask of method to, to do things that are absolutely irrational and, and really terrifying and you know, moral and, and, and immoral and, and horrendously violent. But you started by asking if, it's, if he's interested in actually doing science. And there's, I mean, it is a short story, but it's also a kind of experiment in a certain kind of psychology. It's, it's, a, it's an illustration of the new psychological term monomania. That is that's being circulated and debated in medical circles. He Poe knows what this is, and is is using the story as a way to kind of illustrate what it might be like to inhabit such a sensibility. That's so it's interesting. I mean, in in Poe is doing the same sorts of things with other antebellum norms, like in the stories about marriages that don't work out well, to say the least. He's playing off of expectations about what a regular normal marriage would look like. Um, so that seems to be his, you know, whatever sort of norm he's working with. Uh, but I think the surprising thing about your book is how often he seems to be working with and against norms about science in the time. And, and what makes that fascinating is that science is just getting itself organized 
in the, this part of the 19th century. So like P.T. Barnum is setting up his theater around the same time the Smithsonian Institution is founded, right? So it's this world of hoaxers on the one hand, fraudsters and real scientists as well. Do you see Poe as kind of moving between those two sort of contending forces in American culture? Yeah, and and to see them as contending, I think is really key that they're they're kind of egging each other on. You know, the 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 people who are forming the new institutions, who are working really hard to, to lay a kind of national foundation for the conduct of science, are doing so in response to the the kind of explosion in the public sphere, which is much more suddenly much more dynamic and loud and out of control than it ever had been before, thanks to the press, the telegraph, more and more public spaces. The the scientists are responding to this the space where there are so many spectacles, performances, speculations, claims hoaxes and humbugs that they need to try to get control over it. And likewise, the, the people who are putting on these shows are, are learning from those scientists and taking their ideas and taking them a couple steps further, adding spin, exaggerating them, adding music and light shows and, and magic lanterns to them. So they're really in dialogue. And as you say, Poe is part of what makes him so interesting is that he moves between those two worlds and really identifies with each of them at different moments in his writing, even sometimes in the same text. But often he is writing in his journalism to support the, the movement to try to institutionalize science and to create national institutions to elevate the, the American culture in general. And that's very, very explicit in when he's writing about literature. He's one of the people who's committed to the project of American uh, and American literature that goes above all of the kind of local cliques and divisions that, that are there, you know, the Bostonians versus the Philadelphians versus the New Yorkers. He wants there to be a US literature that can compete on the national stage with Europe. And that's the same thing that the scientists are doing. They want to have a unified American science that can compete with European science. But at other moments, he writes along with Barnum, with along with the, the various hoaxers and, and charlatans, he writes these extremely artful hoaxes that use the, the language and the conventions of, science, of scientific reporting, which he did in other moments of his career. He was one of America's first science reporters, uses their conventions to make claims about discoveries or inventions that never happened. He claims that a balloon crossed the Atlantic when of course it hadn't yet happened. He's, he's got this, he describes in the facts in the case of Monsieur Valdemar, this incredible experiment where a dying man is kept alive for seven months by being mesmerized. And his mind's alive, intact, but his body is slowly decaying. And when the spell ends, the body collapses into a, a pool of unutterable, unutterable putrescence. But yeah, he's really moving between the two. Yeah, right. I mean, in the facts in the case of Valdemar, it's, um, it often strikes me that he's also kind of teetering between comedy and horror, right? Because when Valdemar is lying there over that seven month period, they wake him up every now and then. And he says things like, no, no, don't do this. I am dying or I'm dead. So, you know, like, sure you are. Um, but then it does go very, very soggy at the end. Um, and and so let, let's talk about mesmerism because that's at the heart of that story. And it seems to me that some of these pseudosciences in post time kind of morph and adapt so that people now, especially if they are so inclined, you know, can make the case that something like mesmerism actually had a basis in empirical reality. The same thing with phrenology. And I'm wondering whether you see kind of Poe's take on same mesmerism as being interesting in response to the general uproar and controversy about it. Yeah, that's he. He went where there was controversy. He he loved. He, if it wasn't, and if it wasn't the controversy yet, he'd start one there to to draw attention. I mean, he was very skilled at working in this new media environment and creating you know little squabbles that would generate a lot of a lot of heat and vis and visibility. And mesmerism was you know massively controversial, in part because the people who were advancing it were so assured of its scientific validity. I mean, they followed all the conventions of science. They, they followed all the arguments of, say, ex um, experiments in electricity and magnetism. And it was by very gradual steps that, they're, that they said, what they're doing is just a little bit beyond what, what we've discovered in electricity and magnetism. And it goes, in fact, through these gradual steps across this, this, this enormous divide to allow us to have an experimental science of the mind. 
which, you know, that sounds great. That sounds fascinating. And it was presented in this way. The way they demonstrated it was through these shows or these demonstrations that were meant to be kind of scientific experiments in front of the public, but they were also incredibly entertaining. I mean, you, you, you go and watch someone get put into a spell and then, you know, you can make them quack like a duck if, if you want, or, you know, follow, obey commands or speak with dead ancestors or read books in languages that they didn't know or, or see things across happening across the world. And, you know, it was, it was great spectacle and Poe loved that. And also, took the philosophy of it quite seriously. It, it was connected to ideas in Swedenborg, in Swedenborgianism, which he was very involved with in, in New York, connected to theories of the mind and of matter that, he, that are connected to physics and chemistry that he was also very invested in. So I, I think that um, walking that line between horror and humor that you mentioned is, is ac absolutely correct, but also walking that line between disbelief and belief, you know, between between saying this is this is impossible, this is ridiculous, but also there's something to it that's really, really believable and important and and, and maybe true. And he kept that option open, he kept that oscillating. In, in all of that, you have a sense of uh, Poe as wanting to be masterful, as wanting to be in control of his reader's responses, and of wanting to be authoritative, like to always know the answer. And in some of that, you know, it sort of seems like that might contradict the spirit of science, which is more collaborative and sort of consensus building, right? As opposed to like, I'm the only one who knows the truth. So I think maybe that shifts him away from the sort of pure empiricism side of this over towards the fraud side of it. And, and you know, he has been called a humbug by no less an authority than Jill Lepore for this in, kind of this instinct of manipulating the reader uh, towards his own ends. Definitely. And I mean, he was calling people humbug left and right, and he was occasionally called it himself. So it's it's a kind of epithet that's being thrown around in every direction. And there were people who um, called the, the elite scientists who are together conspiring to create the institutions of American science, ultimately to be able to define what is and what is not a humbug. People called, they, they were called charlatans. They, they were attacked. They were criticized for all kinds of reasons as well. So who is a charlatan and who's an expert? That's something that's getting worked out in this public sp space. And it's it's really a, a constant debate. And it, you know, it bears on the debates in religion, the debates in politics as well. Who can you trust, especially in a media regime where suddenly there's much more printed matter. There are many more magazines and journals and magazines than there ever had been before coming from every possible direction. But the, the ways in which Poe kind of set himself up as the expert, um, that in some ways, yeah, it's different than the actual practice of science. But in some ways, it resembles very much what people like Joseph Henry, the president of the, of the Smithsonian, or Alexander Bache, the director of the Coastal Survey were doing. They wanted to create institutions that would have the last word on all the sciences, to expel it's to keep out of debate the kinds of wild speculations that were happening in the public sphere. So in some ways, yes, it's different from the actual spirit of science, but in many ways, it resembles the rhetoric and the kind of public face that those, those institutionalizing, institutionalizing sciences took on. And, and Poe really moves between them. But I mean, you're, you're more aware of, uh, than anybody of the way in which Poe's kind of pose of mastery was often the setup for you know, a, a terrible fall and a, a terrible joke at his own expense. I mean, at, over and over, he sets himself up as the expert in complete control of the text, his fate, his reputation. And that's right when he slips on the banana peel. That's right when you know, he, he makes a complete hash of things or sets fire to his own life in, in one way or another. He was very yeah. aware of, of kind of self-sabotage as a recurring impulse in, in the human mind. Often on the assumption that no publicity would be bad publicity. So right. you go out and he'll pick a fight with the most beloved writer of his time, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and it just won't work out well for him. Um, no. Again, but again, by assuming that everyone in the American literary establishment has this wrong. And so I'm the only one who can kind of get that right. Um, right. right. I wonder uh, about his, uh, his own effort, uh, famously in the philosophy of composition, to say that he wrote The Raven by almost deducing it from a set of rational principles and rules. Most people haven't believed that, but it seems like an attempt to sort of put the mantle of science uh, 
around the creative process and to claim that the, you know, the writer, the skillful writer uh, is in, so in control of the materials that he can completely determine the effect on the reader. I wonder whether you see the philosophy of composition as one of his hoaxes along with Valdemar or the balloon hoax. Yeah, not, not straightforwardly. I think it's in, an incredibly puzzling and complex piece and it's it, it's open to many different interpretations um and i think and i think that's why it's so lasting people some people have said well of course he's making this up you can't have a set of rules or an algorithm that creates a poem otherwise if you followed them all you do is write the raven over and over right? <laughs> or, and of course he didn't proceed in that way he must have you know he must have had some kind of inspiration but at the same time it's very similar to some of the arguments that he's been making it's kind of an exaggerated version of arguments he has been making about poetry's requirement to be really controlled, directed, methodical, that what makes for powerful poetry is if every element within the, the work adds up and aims towards a single powerful effect. Like if, if, if it's constantly changing tones or styles or, or just loses focus, it, it won't be effective. And I think he, that's a genuine cl critical notion for him. I think he believes that. And I think he's aiming for that in his poetry and in his short stories. That's why you know the, the line of the telltale heart is really quite direct towards that, the, the final revelation, the final you know, confession. And that's true of many of the short stories. But I, I agree that there's a kind of affectation in his saying that I completely followed uh, the rules of method to, to create the, the raven and anyone else could. And that's a kind of subtle satire on the sense in the period that method is going to be the solution for every human problem, that there's an app for everything. There's a, there's a method that will, will, will fix every, every possible uh, issue. And, th and that is an idea that's become strong in the sciences at the time, because the, the sciences were very, um, had progressed a lot in the previous 50 years. They'd, they'd each developed along their own kind of roots, but as they progressed, they got more and more specialized. So it was harder and harder for someone who knew chemistry to understand what was going on in biology or going on in astronomy. And people outside any of those would have a really difficult time knowing what they all had in common. And the thing that people begin to trot out as the, the thing that all sciences have in common is method. So there's a, there's a real uh, interest and excitement around the idea that there might be a single scientific method that can be applied to every domain of knowledge. And Poe's kind of taking that idea and saying, well, if that's true of all the sciences, there might be a science of literary criticism. There might even be a science of poetry, of writing poetry. And yeah. And, yeah. Well, I was going to say, I mean, and that's sort of the way Poe explains his invention of the detective story, that first you create the mystery, then you explain how the detective solves it. So, so yeah. that's that same kind of method is there, right? Yeah, the, and the idea of writing backward, which he uses quite a bit, that you, you start with the outcome. I mean, or you start with the effect, or you start with what you know already happened, and then layer the, the, the series of events that allows you to go seemingly inevitably towards it. And that sense of reversibility, that, that you know, creating something is the same thing as deducing the steps through which someone created it, uh, the reversibility of analysis and imagination shows up over and over in his writing. And, and, that, and in a way, that's the kind of, you know, the, um, the partnership of science and art that he, I think he's really developing as a, as a kind of scientifically interested romantic member of the, you know, the romantic generation or the, the second romantic generation. He thinks science and art really do go hand in hand. So, um, and if you kind of carry that forward to our strange time, then you think about people who are using artificial intelligence to write jokes. That's a thing that's going on. Uh, and obviously various other kinds of literary uh, language. Uh, so maybe this notion, even though Poe could not deduce the raven from principles of pure reason, maybe there's an AI out there that will write, you know, the raven 23rd century. Uh, yeah. I think that's entirely possible. I mean, he's got, you know, he's one of the first people to, to have a kind of reason critique of the possibility of artificial intelligence in Mailsell's Chess Player, which is this essay he wrote when he was in Richmond in his first job as, a, as the editor for the Southern Literary, Literary Messenger. There was a traveling show um, of a robot automaton that was allegedly capable of beating almost every competitor at chess. And the introducer, Meltzel, the, the guy who presented it, said this is a pure machine and 
I won't explain to you how it works, but I'll open the doors one by one and show that there's gears inside it, loads of mechanism inside it. And Poe wrote this article to say, for all these reasons, the, the, the mechanical aspect is being massively exaggerated to hide the fact that there has to be a human hiding inside of it. And chess is very different than a mathematical problem. It's too complex for anyone to um, program mathematically or mechanically. He turned out to be wrong about that, but he, he did have a, a very you know, strong argument for what the limits of the mechanics of his time were. Um, he, there's also a, a machine called the Eureka machine, which shows up in 1845, which I think is one of the inspirations for the philosophy of composition, which is a machine for producing Latin verse, which he would have read about and said, whoa, if they've actually built this, why couldn't I have uh, reverse engineered this for to write to write the Raven? So I think, you know, I, th I think it's entirely uh, I think I think he's an extremely interesting person to think with to understand the history of information theory artificial intelligence, you know, what, what are the limits of the machine and what are the humans? And uh, you, you may have seen the, the famous Chomsky bot that was going around, you know, a, a few years ago, which is you, you enter any word in and it randomly generates language that sounds like a, a text written by Noam Chomsky uh -huh. because there's a spe specific ju uh, jargon for Chomsky. And I think it wouldn't be too hard to write a Pobot like that to you know to, to to use the kind of quite rudimentary AI to to, to create a program that sounds just like Poe, um, either the poetry or or his critical writing. That's hilarious. I could use Matzel's chess player to deal with my nine-year-old grandson who's getting pretty good at the game. You know, there you uh, go. Just wind him up. Yeah. So uh, two books you talk about that many people who know Poe a little won't have come into contact with is this um, book that he wrote about seashells, conchology, and of course, Eureka, uh, which is, you know, for, in his own point of view, his crowning achievement, the last major work of his literary career, uh, but um, not all that readable, although it may be because it does try to answer such profound cosmic questions. I wonder if you want to talk about either of those. Well, or both. The, the, con yeah. the, conchology, the, first, the conchologist's first book he wrote um, right when he got to Philadelphia, at, in that kind of you know, mix of science and publishing that, that really sustained him for years there. And it was a, a work of natural history that he did for a friend who was a traveling uh, lecturer who had written a, a large textbook on shells and needed a smaller version that he could sell cheaply um, to, to the audiences. And Poe took his larger textbook and all the other major works of classifying shells by Lamarck and Cuvier, and I think sat at the library company in Philadelphia in front of a big bust of Athena, which is still there. I don't, I don't think any birds flew in, but I, I think it's the, the kind of primal scene of his imagination, and then carefully recomposed the entire system of classification of shells in a way that Stephen Jay Gould says was really quite innovative for the time. It, it, it made some moves. It reordered the, the, the hierarchy of the, the shells in a way that others had not done and did so ex extremely efficiently following that same idea of effect. So weirdly, the, that's the best-selling book of his lifetime. And it's a science book. It's a, it's a textbook of, of, for shell collectors and, and for students of con conchology. And Eureka is a much stranger beast. And yeah, as you say, he saw it sometimes as the, as the kind of crowning achievement of his life, sort of where everything was heading. And he wrote it in 1847 and 1848. And it's a cosmological uh, treatise. It's a history of the universe and a very radical one, which is based on, on the debates in astronomy, the debates in physics that are happening at the time, especially in the, the kind of growing clash between purely scientific, natural law-based stories of the evolution of, of the universe and the more traditional theological ones. And just a few years before Poe writes Eureka, there's a book called Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation, an anonymous book, which is a huge bestseller that everyone is reading and debating, in part because they don't know who the author is, whether this is just some crank or some amateur or a scientist who's writing um, you know, behind the cover of anonymity. And that's a book which explains the origin of life on Earth, including humans, as just the unfolding of mechanical laws. Mm -hmm. And Poe kind of takes off from that controversy, he takes off from a lot of the ideas in, in vestiges, especially the idea that um, our solar system formed out of nebular clouds and then runs with it and basically tries to think the thoughts of God 
as God created this amazing machine, which is also a poem, which is also an artwork. And one of the really striking things about this, as you say, difficult to read text, is that he's using some of the principles that he's, he's developed to analyze a good poem, to understand how Dickens wrote his, his stories or, or how, how Wordsworth created his poems. He's using those same kinds of principles to evaluate how God must have des designed the universe. And in, in a way, God is just the ultimate poet, and Poe is kind of just a few steps behind him, thinking his thoughts along with him. And he, he thought it was going to revolutionize physics, philosophy, poetry. He, th he, he thought there'd be a run. He asked for 50,000 uh, copies to be printed, and the publisher said, let's just do 500, and even those didn't sell. And it, it's uh, during his lifetime, it didn't have much of an effect. But it's a, it's a work that's been picked up many times afterward by Paul Valéry, the, the French poet, by Isaac Asimov, the science fiction author, and then in the, in the 20th century by physicists who are realizing within it are germs of a lot of the ideas of the new physics, of relativity and quantum mechanics. And there's even a good case to be made that the, the founders of the Big Bang Theory were familiar with Eureka, Eureka and really followed its plot from a single particle rapidly exploding outward to the reaches of the universe. Um, uh, George Lemaitre and Alexander Friedman, who are the the recognized who who invented the Big Bang theory, um, would have known Poe. Friedman was a big fan, and Lemaitre was in circles that would, would have been well aware of what Valéry was doing with Poe. So I think there's this weird possibility that Poe kind of helped invent modern cosmology in this difficult to read poem slash cosmological treatise. That would be quite a payoff for those uh, scientists who made their way through the text of Eureka, <laughs> unlike weary English graduate students who sort like, of struggle oh. their way through it without yeah. the benefit of getting to invent the Big Bang Theory as a partial result of it. Yeah, yeah. And I, I do my best in the book to, to give a kind of clear line through. I'm borrowing from Barbara Cantalupo, who's a, a Poe scholar, who talks, who compares Eureka to a magic lantern show, you know, to a scene of, of popular science and all the changes of perspective, all the kind of changes of tone and the kind of visual language that he uses is really mimicking some of the moves of magic lantern show performances. And I think that's that switch to not try to read it as just a kind of dry text explaining everything, but to understand it as a kind of spectacle, a kind of literary spectacle helps helps find the, the line through. And in, ultimately, the idea is, is not all that complex. It's, it's a particle that expands outward and then collapse back inward. But as, as you're aware, there are many very difficult digressions and changes of tone, changes of style and illusions that are hard to follow. So I, I, I give basically a whole chapter to Eureka and try to make it comprehensible in a kind of clear linear, linear way. I even provide a picture. No, and I think you, I think you do actually. And um, I think the book is going to be particularly interesting to people who know quite a bit about Poe, but not so much about the history of science and people who know a lot about the history of science, but not so much about Poe. Uh, and that brings us to a lot of, uh, a lot of potential readers. I, and, you know, I see the method of, of this book, John, as being very much compatible with the trends over the last few decades towards historicist reading of literary texts, right? So at some point in the past, you would have said, well, you have to read the literary work in isolation from its culture to really get into it and really understand it. But so I'm wondering if you agree that that what you're doing here is kind of parallel to what, oh, uh, someone like Adam Bradford might be doing with studying Poe in relation to antebellum mourning rituals and practices, or someone like Jerry Kennedy might be doing in studying print culture and Poe's relation to that. So this is the historicist project that looks at science in relation to Poe's work. Does that seem like a fair overview? Yeah, definitely. I'm, and I've learned so much from the scholars you know, before me who have been making this move. I think there's a very interesting kind of twist to that story in Poe's case, because as you know, the, the new critics who in literature were the ones who said exactly as you do, that as you just mentioned, that the way to study a text is by in total isolation from its historical context, they're citing Poe. They're citing Poe in the philosophy of composition and in other literary texts, which say you have to study these works as pure art products. 
set aside any moral, any kind of political uh, uh, meaning to them, set aside the author's, uh, author's life, and just understand them in ideal artistic forms. He is at the vanguard of that argument, and he's picked up by the authors who then set that as the, the way that one approaches poems. So there's a real kind of flip that in a way is against part of Poe's own critical ideas to historicize it, because he's always writing far away, right? right? Imagining himself in the domain of Arnheim or in some mystery region of where. To put him back in 19th century antebellum America is, is to really see where this is all coming from, where, where he's standing when he makes all of these leaps. But there, there's, an, there's another interesting aspect to that history, which is people have retold the history of Poe um, through his reception because you know, he was really a scandalous figure for a lot of the 19th and early 20th century, but it's only because there were uh, French authors who took him very, very seriously, Charles Baudelaire, Valerie afterwards, that he began to be recognized as a very important, serious author. So there's a famous work called The French Face of Edgar Allan Poe, which tells that history. And then there was a landmark book that came out 20 years ago, 25 years ago, the American face of Edgar Allan Poe. And that's, those are many of the authors that you're mentioning who, who said, we need to bring him back to that historical setting and see exactly where the, what the sources are. What's he reacting to? What's he fighting against? Who, who are his allies? What's the scene in, in publishing and in, in print culture and reprint culture, copying culture? Meredith McGill's arguments about recopying is defining who, what an author is and making it very difficult to know who an author is. And yeah, I'm very much following that. And it's also, that's a trend in history of science, likewise, to take the ideas and, and bring them back to their historical context. Interesting. I, and also just to sort of finish that line of thought, I mean, the invention of the internet and the access, especially the sort of migration of literary archives onto the internet makes it possible for the density of analysis say for a particular writer, you know, we can snap with a click of the mouse, we can uh, see every version of some Poe work. We can find text, we can look at the magazine that it appeared in. Mm -hmm. uh, we, so I'm just saying that the quantity of material that's available makes for this really fascinating texture. And, and you get a lot of that uh, into the book on the subjects that you pick up. Thanks, thanks. Um, yeah. I think there's a big challenge with that because it means that you can make, you can just go in such insane detail on any text or in any moment that it's, it's extremely difficult, you know, not to, to come back out and say, well, wait, what's the bigger picture? And I was very conscious that, you know, when I first started working on Poe, like more than 20 years ago, you had to go to the library, go to the archive to kind of get these things. And a lot of, I know, God forbid, but a lot, a lot of them are really hard to track down. I mean, especially some of the more obscure magazines. A lot of these now, not all, but a lot are, are available online. And so I, I, trying to balance between the, the, the trying to get the details, find all the sources, find the echoes and the ripples, but also kind of keep a kind of you know, a bird's eye view to follow the trajectory of his life and the historical context as it changes through his fortunately, well, fortunately for a historian, short life. I mean, tragically oh, for him, yeah. of course, but like, you know, if he'd lived for another 40 years, I'd have really had a, a job on my hands. But to kind of keep that kind of big picture um, of, of, of what's, what the changes are, keep, you know, keep track of that. And that, that's the hard thing about, obviously a hard thing about a biography there, in, as opposed to kind of a close study of a, of a, of a few articles, a few essays. Yeah, seems like it might be time to open this up to questions. Uh, Great. Benjamin, are you going to come back in for that? I am, and here I am. So we have a bunch of very great questions. So I'll just kind of go down the list. Um, so here's this first question. The Telltale Heart's narrative is filled with an anxiety of the body, its overwhelming openness via the senses and its frightening interior. You spoke about Virginia's death um, and how it shaped Poe. And I was wondering if Poe's interest in science began with a fear of the body or study of biology or medicine. I don't know if it begins with it, but it certainly always comes back to it. And I think that's, it's, it's a great question. I mean, the, the, there's, people talk about body horror as a genre in cinema and fiction, and, and Poe is definitely a pioneer there. You know, just the, the kind of uh, obscene particularity and possible inevitable decrepitude of the body and just the strangeness of organic form observed in nature and in, in, in oneself. He's coming back to that over and over again, how weird it is to have a body and how weird these things are. And of course, how tragic it is that these things inevitably break down and collapse. And he's seeing that all around him. I mean, the, 
it's 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 Virginia for sure. Her long protracted illness, but his mother who dies of of the same illness, you know, when he's two years old, and other people dying around him. There's death had not yet been moved into the hospital, moved off stage the way it is in our time. It was very, very present in everyday life. And people were well aware of, of the stages one goes through um, in moving towards that death. And again, writing against the, convection, the conventions of the time where there was a lot about the beauty of death, death and the beauty of mourning. You know, Poe showed that may be true and he, he writes a lot of idealized visions of death and mourning, but it's also a pretty nasty business. And, and he's making that very visible and in part because it's so visible for him. Great, thank you. So we have a question from um, Beth Houston in the audience who um, was wondering if you could give us some examples of Poe's science journalism. What was he writing about um, that kind of thing? Um, pretty much anything and everything. Um, one major example, a lot of this is happening when he's in Philadelphia after he's published that conchology um, textbook. So he's got a reputation as a scientific expert. When he's working, his first editing job in Philadelphia is for Burton's Gentleman's Magazine. And he st sets up a series, a column called Chapters in Art and Science, the chapter in Art and Science. And that's basically just digesting all the inventions, all the new discoveries that are out there. Okay, a, a new planet's been, a, a new comet's been seen, a new planet, new asteroids have been seen. Here's a new, here are new, uh, new lenses that allow you to look at the sun. Here's some roller skates. You know, here's a new, new bridge that will stop uh, railroad accidents. He's reporting on all of it and saying, well, this one sounds plausible. This doesn't sound so likely, or this is, this is obviously borrowed from uh, some other scientist. So he, he literally is writing columns of science reporting. He also is one of the first people to write about the daguerreotype, the earliest form of, of photography, as it's being invented, as it's being transformed in Philadelphia, mingling with the scientists and inventors who are really improving the process, making it, po making it possible to take portraits for the first time. That's in Philadelphia while, while he's there. But quite a bit on natural history as well. I mean, of course, the shells, but also insects, the gold bug. There's another crazy story of his called the Sphinx, where it's all about knowing how to identify um, insects. Um, there's hints of evolution in lots of the stories, and ultimately astronomy comes back over and over again. Nebulae, the formation of planets, the, the, the origin of the solar system. He has these spirit colloquies, which, were, which are located in outer space, but are borrowing from a lot of the ideas of astrophysics of the time. Um, and he writes about discoveries um, in, in, in these domains. And Eureka is a kind of synthesis of the, the factual and the fictional interests of Poe towards science, because both are, very, are there very, very deliberately. I want to turn to Eureka because we have a question from <clears throat> Philip Phillips in the audience, who sounds like he's very excited to see both of you at the fifth International Poe Conference. Um, in and Boston. Continue this in Boston, I know, <laughs> the, the original city of Poe. Um, so I just want to, um, he asks uh, about your reading um, of the fascinating text, which I think you've already provided, but he asks this really great question, um, which I think kind of also speaks to like the Raven and some of what we were discussing today. Um, what do you believe that Poe thought was the relationship between poetics and science? Yeah, great and very, very tricky question. Um, it, he has an idea that poetry fiction or romance and science are three distinct genres and have three distinct M ends. And he says that very early in one of his first kind of critical texts, the, the letter to be, that the, they each work in different ways in their pursuit of a higher ideal. There's a kind of idealism to all of his, his theories in all these, all these domains, but they use different methods, more or less definite, more or less exact. Um, and so, um, Science uses an exactitude to arrive at truth, whereas poetry uses the indefinite to arrive at beauty. And fiction uses, I think, exactitude to arrive at beauty as well. Um, that's an early statement. And there's a kind of dialectic between um, Eureka and a piece that he writes later, um, The Poetic Principle. Eureka is about how you can use science to arrive at beauty. And The Poetic Principle is, is about using beauty to arrive at a kind of truth. And the, they, the two are complementary and closely intertwined. Um, so I, I, I see those two very late pieces as in dialogue about how, although they use different means, they tend toward the same ideal. And this is a kind of you know, classic notion of idealism that 
the beautiful is a symbol of the good and true. And he's, you know, that, that goes back to Plato and it's there in Kant and Poe is kind of resurrecting it in, in his period. So in some ways they really combine and merge, but as, as I'm sure, uh, Philip, you're, you're, you're thinking about, there are other moments where he tries to really parse and dissect the differences between the different genres and keeping those all steady, given that he moves around so much and sometimes misquotes himself and misquotes other authors is a, is a challenge. So it looks like we have just two more questions. Please, everyone in the audience, feel free to submit more, um, though we might have time for both of these. Um, so this came in before you mentioned Barbara Cantalupo's um, reading of, of Eureka as a sort of magic lantern show. Um, but we have a question. So you began with your own magic lantern show with the PowerPoint that included a brilliant illustration of light entering a room, illuminating that fearsome eye. Is there a way to imagine Poe's work, and I guess all of his work, as a lantern show itself, rife with ideas, technology, and narrative? Definitely. And thanks for that question. And I think that's that really is at the heart of the, the way I'm reading Poe, because it's he's got a, a very um, elaborate and, and very strong theory of the imagination as something very, you know, as crucial, it's central. Tales of Mystery and Imagination was a later collection of, of his work. Um, for all the romantics, imagination is, is very, very important. He is reading Coleridge, who sees the imagination as this kind of divine faculty that it's, it's through the imagination that we resemble God. It's a kind of gift to be able to create something out of nothing. And he's very steeped in, in Coleridge and, and Wordsworth, but he makes this crucial break from Coleridge by saying that actually it's impossible to create from nothing. Creation is obviously what poets do and artists do, but what you're doing is rearranging elements that are already there. Only God can create from nothing. The artist is, re is, making, is putting things together in a kind of chemistry of the intellect is, is the term he uses. So there's a kind of practical, physical, material, chemical, but also technological dimension to his sense of the imagination. So if, if the mind is, is a lamp lighting up the world or a mirror reflecting the world, for Poe, the, the, it's, the mind is a kind of magic lantern. There's a technological interface between us and the world. That, that shapes how we see the world, sometimes you know, altering what, what, what we see, sometimes being, being able to project it outward, if as an artist, as a poet, to transform readers and, and viewers' view of the world. Everywhere, technologies of audiovisual uh, amplification show up in his work as a kind of theme for what I think he's doing. We're, we're using, we're, ideas are entering our mind into the kind of cam camera obscura of, the, of our minds, being reversed, being combined, and then projected outward again in artworks. And, and literally magic lanterns is the, are the you know, most advanced AV technology of the time. Um, there's a new twist in magic lanterns that shows up in the 1840s in Philadelphia, um, which is the dissolving view. I mean, it, it travels, it's from London, but it travels to Philadelphia, where you take two magic lanterns and project uh, a similar image on the same spot and then gradually shift one to the other, and that creates the illusion of movement or growth or change. And th so the dissolving view is a kind of early camera, an early cinema, cinematic projector. And there are many stories that he writes that are kind of dissolving view magic lantern stories. Even reviewers saw this. They said about his um, Tales of the Grotesque and Absolute that this is an amazing uh, uh, presentation of the magic lantern show of the, of the imagination, the, of, a, of a colorful imagination. So it's a, it's a very on, on point question. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I actually, so Paul, it sounds like you have one last question you'd like to ask. Um, yeah, there's something uh, in the back of my mind, John, which is about sort of your point that Poe is interested in these horror stories with these unreliable narrators in something like the psychology of the abnormal or criminal mind. And I wonder, and I do think that's one of his real achievements, this kind of, in the world of fiction, the way he managed to sort of develop the notion of the unreliable narrator. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that makes some of those stories so interesting to young readers, oddly enough, because they, they always, they're sort of moving out of this world where literature is kind of preachy and straightforward and, um, and suddenly they run into this. 
But I'm wondering how much do you think he actually achieves in the well in the realm of abnormal psychology? Like how differentiated are are his killers having different sort of causality or I don't know. I, for me, that's been a real question. I don't know that there's an answer. Um, yeah, I, I don't have I don't have an answer, and I'd, it'd be very interesting for like a contemporary criminologist to 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 read Poe and say what's the difference between this version of monomania or this version of you know the paranoid paranoid disorder. Um, they do tend to be quite similar in the in the flavor of their paranoia and kind of you know their obsess obsessiveness. But probably you could make some some distinctions among them. I think uh, uh, there is a strong argument to be made that our theories of psychopathology do owe a lot to Poe, because you know Freud it was reading all the fantastic authors that Poe was reading. E. T. A. Hoffman's his big source, but he was aware of Poe as well. His student Marie Bonaparte in France. Um, wrote the book that really introduced psychoanalysis to France, Freudian psychoanalysis. I mean, she was analyzed by Freud first, um, but then analyzed Poe, turned around and did it to Poe. And it's a, 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 a yeah, in a giant tone. Every text is, you know, is, is, is in, uh, uh, for him, for her, every, every story is an example of Poe's particular pathology. And whether or not her particular readings of those texts hold up, it introduced to a French audience, and you know, from there, many other audiences. She had quite a wide readership. The basic ideas of Freudian psychoanalysis, in a way that was more accessible than some of Freud's own own works, and so Poe really gave us the kind of tools to understand some of the 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 ways in which psychoanalysis understands the criminally insane or or psychopathology, and and above all, the the kind of psychopathology of everyday life that the kind of the insane killer is not that different than anybody else. That the, those same kind of forces of what he calls perverseness, of destructiveness, um, are there everywhere in the human mind. And that was one of his big criticisms of phrenology and other psych psychological schools, that they, they had organs for self-improvement, for benevolence, for amativeness, for you know, kindness and benevolence. They didn't have the organ of self-destruction. And Poe saw in himself, and everyone else, and I think arguably in the entire universe, that destruction, self-destruction, chaos is as much a driving force as harmony, beauty, beauty, and order. And that's what makes him such a comforting and soothing writer to read. Well, yeah, you, you certainly can recognize him, whether, whether or not you, you feel reassured by what he has to say. There's a certain truth to, to, to a lot of it. And as you point out, there's a lot of fun to it as well. I mean, these these kind of grim realizations about the human condition or about you know ex our existential situation. He also shows you how to laugh at them, even in the most horrific ones. Like there is a real kind of grim, yeah, graveyard humor to them. That yeah, you can't you can't help but laugh, and because what else are you going to do? Yeah, he he really delights in it in the way that charlatans delight in you know some of the most morbid things. Um, it's true. It's and I, true. I think that's why we keep reading him as with so much delight. Um, so and horror. That, and horror, of course. Um, so that is all the time we have. Looks like we're out of questions too. Thank you so much to both of you for this fantastic conversation. Um, and thanks to all of you out there for spending part of your afternoon with us. Please learn more about this incredible book and purchase The Reason for the Darkness of the Night at harvard.com. I put the link to purchase in the chat a couple times. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, enjoy your weekend, keep reading, and stay safe. Thank you, everyone, for this. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thanks, John. Thanks, Benjamin. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.